Hello and welcome to White Sinopi Noise Podcast. I'm Oscar Brummel, and this week my guest is Stefan Auni, who runs the label New Forces and records and performs as Jostad, Breaking the Will, and is a member of Form Hunter, Cryo Scene, and Action Discipline. If you like this podcast and want to support it, head over to patreon.com slash white centipede noise to check out the benefits of doing so. Stefan, welcome to White Sand Noise Podcast. Thank you so much for... You were here once before with um, Luke and Brad, but uh, yeah, thanks for meeting me today to talk one-on-one about... Glad to be back. Shout out Luke and Brad. Yep, absolutely. Um, also, guys that I want to get on here individually some day soon. But um, so you and I... We know each other. F- we've known each other for quite a long time. I think back, I will, at least I would say ten years. My my guess um, would have been maybe two thousand nine or two thousand ten. That sounds right. Yeah, I'm not super good with dates, but you were living in Minneapolis, and I started seeing you at noise shows around the time that I was really active with noise. So I kind of I'd like to kind of hear about the origins of New Forces and your noise projects. And I kind of assume those things all kind of start around the same time. So can you bring it back to Minneapolis? When you were living in Minneapolis um, and kind of getting involved in the, in the noise scene there, how did you get get into it in the first place? And what did that what was that like for you? Yep. So being in my mid-30s, uh, like many people, I discovered noise because stuff like Wolf Eyes and Purrant and Hair Police was getting coverage on indie rock online websites. For example, before Pitchfork was a kind of general media conglomerate and it just covered indie rock, whatever that is, right? Mm-hmm. They started running articles about stuff like Wolf Eyes and so on. And so me and a couple of friends paid a little bit of attention. Uh, and then I went to college in the Twin Cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul, uh, and had been into punk and hardcore. Um, and then, so I had this sense of noise. I'd sort of played around with it, not very seriously in high school. And then going to punk and hardcore shows, right, as you know, in Minneapolis, there is this kind of overlap or bleed. Yeah. So a definitive moment would have been, I saw that grind band, Endless Blockade, uh, play a house in Minneapolis, and uh, Juyo and Endless Bummer opened. Juyo, of course, uh, Bill and Brian, stalwarts of the Minneapolis noise scene, um, criminally underrated. Yeah. And then at that time, Endless Bummer had Grant of Nod fame doing electronics in it. Right. And so I'm never going to forget the Geo set. You know, I was in this basement to see a punk show, and they set up this table and then filled it with electronics. And if anyone's seen Geo, they play with a lot of gear. They know yeah. the Trogatronic guys. They have all this kind of custom stuff. You know, now I have a better sense, but even even now I don't know all of the stuff they're playing with. And at the time, it was overwhelming to see them set this stuff up. And then... They did this thing where they had those like uh, kitchen timers you put on a stove. They each lifted it up. They went one, two, three. They hit play at the same time. They played for exactly 20 minutes. Uh, and it blew my mind. Yeah. Was that when they were playing facing each other? Facing each other. Big table full of gear. Yeah. You know, like I said, I'd heard like Wolf Eyes Burn Mind or some Purrant or some Hair Police. But the stuff they were doing, I didn't have any frame of reference to make sense of what that was. Yeah. But I loved it, and then I loved endless uh, endless bummer, 
and that kind of piqued the interest that there wasn't just kind of this national thing, but there was local stuff that I should maybe go try to find. Uh, so I set out to try to find it. Um, and unsurprisingly, very quickly, stumbled across Phage Tapes. Yeah. Um, who you've, of course, had, Sam Stokes, and have had on the show. Uh, he gets all the credit for why I'm doing New Forces or even doing my own projects, which we can talk about. Uh, and so I think, I don't know, I ended up at a few more shows. Um, another one that sticks out in my head is Peter J. Woods with you opening as Wince. And I think Disthroned Agony and probably Ice Volt, Bryce Beverly. Where, where was it? Rat Hole. Uh -huh, okay. This is a show where Steph did the enema and was throwing the feces stuff. all over the crowd. So, but that wasn't the one in the art gallery. No, it wasn't the art gallery. It was basement. Okay. Uh, and I think I maybe like had discovered Peter's stuff by then and had so ordered some. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I started showing up at shows and, you know, getting to know you and Sam and Joe and Grant. Uh, and it was great because you know, kind of having a sense of what was going on in punk and hardcore, the Minneapolis move at the time was to almost always put a punk band on the noise show. Right. And have them play last. I mean, in some ways, very calculated, right? You have them play last, and then people show up for the show. Mm -hmm. And there was a reasonable amount of overlap of interest as well. I mean, it wasn't totally cynical. Right. Um, but, you know, Minneapolis is such a punk town that yeah. to get access to those spaces, you kind of had to do that move, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it definitely had like a punk. A lot of the noise projects had kind of a punk bent to them, or it was people involved in punk. And I think like the bastard noise influence was pretty strong. Absolutely. I mean, it's an interesting kind of distinction, right? It was people doing kind of punk stuff that were doing interesting electronics things, as opposed to maybe people that had like a sense of this global noise scene that really loved Incapacitance or right. Mersbo. Or White House or whatever. It was a yeah. little bit different, which is interesting. And I think it's kind of a product of that time where you had these like noise adjacent punk bands like Pig Heart Transplant or Endless Blockade and so on. Um, that is true. I, I I do remember that being a thing. I think I've talked about it probably a couple times in the podcast. It's just like talking then to people at shows and like trying to talk about the international noise groups and artists that I was discovering and finding that a lot of these noise artists people playing noise shows at noise shows had no exactly. idea they, about they them. didn't they have like, a sense of what Hanson was doing or Kondritic was doing or what hospital was doing. Right. They, you know, it was like just kind of a local thing. Yeah. And yeah, yeah the bastard's influence would be big. For sure. That was huge. Everyone had a fucking tattoo, you know? Oh yeah. Um, so then how did that lead up to you starting your own label? It was getting to know Sam uh, and, you know, I don't know. It, I think probably the desire to make the sound came first. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I would have bought some gear. I mean, I think the first pedals were like a Boss DS1 and a DOD Grunge. I worked somewhere where I had access to these contact mics. And so starting out very primitive, just tinkering, uh, but at a certain point, and, and Sam was encouraging me this whole time, right? Because once you just, like, at that time, once you discovered Phage, Phage was easily the most active label. You know, Sam was arguably running himself ragged, putting out tape after tape after tape after tape, yeah. hand screen printing everything, you know, totally insane, actually. Yeah. Um, and, you know, with his encouragement and my own interests, I had some gear. And then at a certain point, Sam and I think Joe, but probably Sam mostly, were like, we're going to put you on a show. So at that point, you need a project name and you need something that you feel reasonably good enough to put in front of people, right? I mean, it's it's a nice kind of pressure to say, look, pal, you got to play. Yeah. So figure it out. It would have been, I remember it, it was a lead up to one of those heavy focus Minneapolis noise fests in probably 2010. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I played the show and it went great. I mean, I still think it's one of the best shows I've ever played because I think like for noise, there's a stage where ignorance is bliss and not yeah. knowing what you're doing <laughs> makes it really good in this funny way. And then you start trying to do stuff and it gets less good. 
Sure. And then, it, and then it comes back around and you figure out what you're trying to do and then it maybe gets a little better again. Yeah. Um, but that, that, that early phase, there's a kind of magic to that that I wish I could go back to, but you know, you can't go back to. So those guys just put me on a show. And so I played the show and then I played that fast and then you were off to the races. And I think discovering noise at that time, it was very easy to get the sense that if you're going to have a project, you're going to have a label too. Like that's just the natural thing. Right. And we can debate how healthy that is, but that was just the deal. Right. So I did a split with Baculum that Sam put out, right? You know, he did my first two releases. So none of this happens without him. Uh, and then the first kind of solo breaking the will cassette came out in time for that heavy focus fest. Uh, so I did tapes for breaking the will baculum being Luke Tandy right. and Kafar. Yeah. All people I'm still friends with. So the label yeah. got off to a great start. Um, and I guess 2010, 2011, whatever year that was. Mm -hmm. Cool. Did you have any vision or, or idea that it would, grow into what it is now at the time when you were starting it? Did you, did you think, yeah, okay, no. I want to build this up? And No. Um, no. Because, I don't know. There weren't, like, the small tape label was the model. I'm not sure a lot of people started tape labels thinking they were going to become Hanson or Hospital or Tesco. And not that that was a bad thing. Like, I think the predominant model was this sort of smaller tape label sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, vinyl would have seemed out of reach. Right? People were buying less CDs at the time. Yeah. So that seemed like the natural place to start. Um, and then, you know, through a process, and it ended up growing. I mean, I can say that I didn't, I didn't think I'd stumbled on a fad for myself. Right? I mean, people come in and out of music scenes, and that gets critiqued. I don't think that's the worst thing in the world. That's kind of a natural thing. But I did have the sense that I discovered something that was going to have some legs as far as my interest. Mm -hmm. um, just cap noise captured my imagination in this way that felt unique and has obviously you know, maintained itself. Out now on Input Error Records, the Rita and OVMN Split LP. A brand new sidelong track each by two legendary stalwarts of massive harsh noise sound, featuring splintered electronics, crackling textures, and overblown bass. Available directly at input-error.co.uk and selected distros. This is a question I was going to ask you at the very end, but it's kind of like ripped out of this context, but you just remind me of it. Can you describe what it is you love about noise? I mean, I grew up playing the piano and the cello, playing in orchestras, and it felt amazing to jettison that musical language and replace it with something else that felt more instinctual, uh and abstracted like there's things like atmosphere and texture and tactility and feeling that are a little harder to quantify but are there and you can kind of experience them so it felt good to like not worry about melody or rhythm a little bit uh the sounds feel good there's something in my brain that feels good about these sounds um which doesn't mean that noise is always like you know, sunshine and flowers and positivity, you know, so, but even like a kind of harsh or negative or something that's exploring negative themes, there's something about the actual sound in my ears that continues to feel very good. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know, it, it felt so much bigger than, you know, discovering punk or hardcore metal or whatever. I, I, when I started like wanting to buy releases, it felt like I tapped this well that had no bottom to it. I mean, I've got memories of just, you know, browsing some of those distros that were active at the time, like Hanson or Mimoroglu or Eclipse Records or Hospital or Self Abuse and just page after page after page of stuff, some of it quite old that was still there. Mm -hmm. And wondering what is all this stuff? You yeah. know, like 
the idea that something that was rather limited in, in its edition size could just sit there forever and then could be discovered. The sounds were so varied. I mean, I would say early on, a lot of the more kind of ambient or drone stuff is what I was mostly interested in. Stuff like Yellow Swans, mm-hmm. Robe Door, Emeralds. I had a friend that was going to the No Fun Fest that turned me on to some of that stuff. And then yeah. I ended up going to one of the No Fun Fests and then discovering some of the harsher stuff. Uh, it, it, it felt and it continues to feel like there's so much to explore and I haven't hit the bottom yet. And that continues to capture my imagination. I mean, I'm interested in things like archives and research, and there's just so much here to find and figure out that it continues to kind of capture my imagination in that way. Have you ever, or do you ever see yourself getting burnt out at it or being over it? I wouldn't say burnt out or over. I mean, you know, I don't, you know, who knows? There's a, a million hardcore songs written by 20 year olds that are like, I will never forsake this. And then, you know, in five years. <laughs> so I don't want to like make some kind of rules where I'm not allowed to sort of evolve, but yeah. uh, there's no plans to get bored. Yeah. There's no plans to lose interest. Hasn't happened yet. I don't anticipate it happening. You know, I try to stay interested in the new stuff, which I think is a crucial part of it. Yeah. Um, I think once you're like only listening to the, the genres hits from 20 years ago, then you've kind of lost touch of what's going on. Yeah. Um, it's not, you know, it's not the worst thing, but I think to keep a high level of interest, knowing the new stuff is important. What do you think about people who, you know, say noise is dead? I mean, what does that mean? Like the John Olson thing was the famous one. And I think he was, I mean, who know? I don't far be it for me to speculate on what he meant. I think, my interpretation of what he meant is that it's sort of like boom of noise in the first decade of the 21st century kind of came and went. Not necessarily wrong about that, right? The kind of no fun fest era that's responsible for putting this on my, in front of me. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were both running labels around then, right? There's a little bit of a, a dip, I think. Yeah. And I started new forces kind of at the start of that sort of, sort of downslide where you could just like put a, unknown tape on a message board and it would sell out like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just clearly not dead. But I mean, as, as an art form, you know, people think, you know, kind of like the, the meaning of noise or like what it's supposed to be. Cause... Like, is it challenging? Is it pushing boundaries? Yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah. You know, to be honest, I don't worry that much about that stuff. I mean, I have the things that I like. If there's things that I'm still personally finding interesting, that's enough for me. I don't feel like yeah. I need to sort of, act as the caretaker for the artistic sanctity of the genre and smarter people than me can try to do that. But as far as I'm interested, I mean, this is in some ways, this is a selfish answer. If I'm still interested, then I'm happy. And I am still interested. There was good releases this year and last year. And that's all that matters for me personally. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, So now kind of fast forwarding to new forces nowadays, do you have a specific label philosophy behind what you do with the label, you know, generally or how you curate it, how, what your aims are with it? In a, in an aesthetic sense, it's what do I like? The label should be a reflection of that in a kind of practical sense. Cause I think a label is also kind of a practical and logistical thing. It's just kind of always do better. Um, if you're going to start a label, you can't expect to have it be perfect every time. You're going to make mistakes and you're going to learn valuable lessons. Uh, and so setting yourself some kind of uh, rule that everything needs to be perfect every time isn't realistic. But if your rule is I want to keep getting better every time, I think you'll be in a good place. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as the curation, I mean, the curation, and people ask about this, right? Because this always comes up in the question about, you know, should you send demos? or the people that are spamming label with labels with demos with clearly no thought to whether that's a fit, it's a form email, right? That's obviously really irritating. Um, you know, I'll ignore those. A personal one, I'll usually respond to. And the answer is usually no. And the answer isn't no because I don't think what they're doing is interesting or good. Or and the answer isn't no because I'm not trying to find out new things. With the curation of the label, I'm constantly trying to reproduce... Uh, the feeling I had when I first got into noise, which is finding something 
on my own and getting really excited about it. I'm, I'm kind of continually chasing that feeling with the curation. And so mm -hmm. I don't want to kind of have it just set in front of me. I want it to kind of bubble up and then through whatever organic process be like, oh, this is really cool. I want to reach out to this person and see what they're doing. What else are they doing? Right. Maybe try yeah. to catch the project right when it's like really, you know, kind of taking that leap upwards, which many projects do, right? It's not uncommon for someone to do a few releases and then like it clicks and suddenly it jumps up several levels. Right. Um, I love seeing that moment. Um, but yeah, in general with the creation, I'm trying to kind of, I'm, I'm constantly chasing that feeling of ordering those first noise tapes and getting really excited about them and be like, what is this? I want to know more about this. Yeah. <laughs> Hotel, Karas LP, a buried in slag and debris release, available from the label and distros in North America and Europe. What are some of the important things you've learned along the way during during the label? Maybe, you know, as a curator, from a creative perspective, or also on a more logistical perspective? Check things three times typos, mistakes, and measurements, right? You're going to punish yourself if you keep having to go back and print things over and over again. Be careful about that. Uh, you know, try to treat people respectfully and fairly. Be polite in your communication. Um, you know, work hard. And understand that you're going to do things that looking back, you're like, oh, I would have done that differently. And don't get necessarily hung up on that. Just use that as a lesson to fix it the next time around. You know, I there there are people whose visual and aesthetic sense is better than mine, and so I kind of defer to them. Someone like Justin Lakes or something. Um, I you know I I I I get things to where I think they look really great, and that's my goal. Um, but I'm not going to act like my visual art. I'm, I'm not a visual artist in the way some of these people are. And so part of learning with new forces is, has been acquiring some of these skills that don't actually come at all naturally to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a good space you can operate in where you kind of know your limits and make things look really good within your limits Yeah. while also pushing them some in productive ways. Um, but I think the, 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 the most of the mistakes labels make, especially new ones, is just logistical. Like, I think people aren't ready for the degree to which you got to kind of have your s stuff together to make this work. You need to be able to get to the post office. And you need to me be able to have materials on hand and be on your email and do all this stuff. It's all really boring and uninteresting, but you just you have to be able to do it. Um, or, you know, run one of those labels that's esoteric and hard to get a hold of. That's fine, too. But if you want to sort of, you, you, you don't want to be ripping people off. <laughs> yeah. So with the label aesthetic, there is, I feel, a pretty pretty consistent, like, political, historical undercurrents to a lot of the the imagery, even the name, you know, the logo. Um. Can you expand on that? You know, the industrial historical document compilations and, uh, you know, the texts that are on the, the flaps of the, the J cards. Yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, you know, interests coinciding. I'm interested in history and the histories of empires and war and colonialism and foreign policy. Uh, but I don't want those interests to kind of be overbearing, which is sometimes a fine line, right? like the difference between aesthetic and injecting a kind of overt 
conceptual thing to the release, which mm -hmm. I'm wary of, because that should be more the artist and less me. Um, those industrial historical series were just, you know, it's interesting to take a specific historical processes or event and turn artists loose on it. That's all those were. Um, and I think the outcomes were pretty interesting. The texts the text were funny. For a while, I had this kind of ritual where I would go to my bookshelf and kind of impulsively grab stuff and try to find little interesting words or phrases and pull them out. Um, I thought that ran, it, ran its course, so I stopped doing that. But it's just trying to give, give things uh, an aesthetic and conceptual uh, terrain in which they exist that is compelling but not overbearing. Mm -hmm. um, because, yeah, I mean, getting into, like, particularly industrial music, but also noise, it seemed in touch with history in a way that other genres aren't so much. Um, and sometimes really overt ways. And I'm realizing now that this is maybe something that's very unique about noise and industrial music, the degree to which it engages with historical events. Um, that's true. Seems pretty, seems pretty unique, actually. Uh, and that the aesthetics and content of that was compelling um, and remains compelling. Um, you know, I think it par partly grows out of the industrial tradition of reacting to punk a little bit, where punk is like screaming about the stuff it doesn't like, and industrial is just saying, look at this. Right. Instead. Um, so, yeah, that's some of the motivation, I think, too. Um, I opened up questions for you uh, f to Patreon supporters. And one question someone had here uh, just a few minutes ago was, when and how were you acquainted with Jeff German's work and what was it like working with him on the bioelectric release? Uh, discovered Jeff actually comparatively later. N knew, knew about him and hadn't explored it much. And then the first thing I really fell in love with was the... LP you did the Bray Harp mm -hmm. um, and then like you know kind of got very deeply into it uh, so that's a more recent revelation you know I didn't discover that 10-15 years ago I wish I had um, but working on that stuff was great I think you know I'm like I said I'm interested in sort of archival processes uh, and Jeff's stuff jeff still makes new stuff that's really great and so people should all be getting that yeah but he also has a you know a very large catalog yeah um the hands to stuff can is you know a varying difficulty to get the sound of pig tapes are kept in print so that's great but the other stuff's harder to get the only real kind of reissue stuff that had been done with hands to is uh the dvdr with mp3 files which, which is cool appeals to some people you know, it doesn't, no, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't make that it, it's what you're doing is important needs to be done. But I think that was also, I would, that's a pretty cool release, but maybe yeah, no, no, if, no criticism of that, just kind of not my cup of tea necessarily. Yeah. I'm, I'm still very tethered to the ritual of picking something out and putting them and putting it on the stereo and like sitting yeah. and enjoying it. Um, so, so yeah, I, th I felt there was a need and, you know, I approached them and, and, and we've been working on it, uh, you know, trying to do a good job, get, you know, Unlike many people from that era, Jeff has done a pretty good job of saving his his archive. Mm -hmm. uh, and so getting things remastered from original tapes, that's very valuable. Mm -hmm. Grant Richardson has done an amazing job with that. Uh, very meticulous job going through, you know, so one of these boxes, you're talking about more than six hours of audio yeah. recorded in the 80s and early 90s. It's a lot of work. Yeah. Um, digging into Jeff's archive. Jeff seems to be one of those people that saves stuff which, you know, becomes great 20, 30 years down the line. Um, for sure. I loved it for the Domain Poetique reissue we did. Jeff had saved all of the correspondence that he'd done with John Hudak, which is the other member of Domain Poetique. Yeah. And so you can see, if you get that release and you open up the, the poster, you can see the process of developing those ideas through the mail in real time as you listen. Very cool. That's super uh, cool. Jeff's phenomenal. Great guy. Yeah. Uh, not you know not enough nice things to say about jeff. jeff jeff has an interest in the natural world and the environment that intersects with my own mm -hmm. um you know jeff has been thinking about how things sound outside for so long and in so, such interesting ways 
um, which I have a kind of academic interest in. I'm interested in environmental history. Uh, I have a sonic interest in. Um, and so it's been nothing but a delight. And we're going to keep working on uh, that that campaign. The next, the next project is going to be some of the more ambient fewer recording tapes, a lot of them which have kind of indigenous names. Um, so this would be like early 90s. That's the next next stop on this uh, on this train with Jeff. Cool. That's great. And that's a good reminder too for myself and for I think anyone out there who's doing any sort of noise work for your own sake, but also for the sake of the future, try to be good about archiving and saving your stuff. That's my inclination. I know some people are more of the like, you know, burn it down and move on mindset, which yeah, I get. Yeah, I know, but someday that's going to be like... Well, yeah, I'm a saver. I like to, you know, see the history of it. Yeah. And I think to, to feel that way at this moment is one thing, because I've felt that way too. I've thrown a bunch of shit away or deleted <laughs> masters. That I thought, oh, fuck, I'll never need that. And even like five, ten years later, I'm like, gee, that'd be pretty cool to have right now. You're you know? not going to be the same person in ten years that you were, but if you're still interested in noise, that stuff might look very different than it did. Yeah. And so yeah, it's I mean, hopefully you're not, you're not the same person. But I think just to, I don't know how many. I mean, there's a lot of stuff coming out. Not definitely not necessarily all that needs to be saved and someday reissued. That's for sure. But if you're doing something, just keep hold on to it because. A lot of the people that didn't think they were doing something that special or fantastic or amazing, it'd be really, really great to be able to go back and hear what they were working on or, or yeah. have access to that. Absolutely. And people are just like, oh, I didn't need it. No one, no one cared at the time, threw it away. You know. What's one of the most satisfying outcomes you've had? Well, okay, here's a question I had. That's a question I have, and another person had a question from the Patreon, which kind of coincides, so we'll meld them together. The person from the Patreon asked, what has been your favorite release on New Forces to date? <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, the <laughs> the annoying answer is it's usually the most recent one. Yeah. Um. Yeah, there's not a there's not a good answer to that. I think the Domain Poetique box looms large just because of how inaccessible that stuff was. Yeah. You know, I I I I chase uh chase recordings and collect pretty fervently. Um and aside from the sound of pick tapes, I had never seen one of those domain boutiques available anywhere in anyone's collection. Mm -hmm. Obviously some people have them, but giving people a chance to hear that stuff, that felt pretty good. Um so, you know, we'll say that one, but you could ask me this question 10 times. I give 10 different answers. Sure. Tell me about the zine that you do. Yeah. I don't know. That was just another kind of DOI thing where it's like, guess I'll do a zine. You know, I didn't sit and scheme and ponder. It's just, and that's, that's one of the things I've liked about being involved in DOI culture in general, but particularly noise. It's kind of giving me this impetus to like, just go do stuff. Uh, and there's going to be, you're going to swing and miss sometimes and sometimes you'll connect, right? And that's okay. But I was like, oh, I guess I'll just do a zine. Um, mm -hmm. and I just did, you know, not, and, you know, not knowing, you know, you can make an argument that I should have sat there for six months and like planned it out a little bit more. The first issues would look better, but I didn't, I just kind of did it and learned as I went. Um, and so I think for some reason at the beginning, I had this weird idea that I had to like lay them out on the computer and I'm not particularly great at that. So they look a little funny the first couple issues, but they started to look better once I got into the, the Xerox style. But I felt like there was a, there was a space that was missing. We had a couple good kind of industrial parlotronic zines that were doing a great job of covering like European heavy electronics or kind of the more extreme end of yeah. the noise underground, uh, but in the kind of post 2010 moment, something more U.S. centric, that stuff wasn't getting as much attention. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the stuff post what some people refer to as the noise boom, right? The kind yeah. of first decade of the 21st century, the no fun era, where like mainstream indie journals are paying attention, that kind of dies down. Um, but there's still stuff going on. It's maybe getting a little less interest. I wanted to cover that stuff. 
um, a lot of like U.S. noise artists. Um, and so I did, I don't know, I think I did maybe 10, 11 normal issues. Uh, and then I just got a little burnt out or fatigued of doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, and so now I do these little free one sheets that I include with orders. No. Um, so if anyone's interested, you can send me an email. I'm happy to send you the, excuse me, the PDFs of those. Uh, and yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm interested in the history of stuff. I, I appreciate zines that want to get really into the, like, what is your concept? What do you think art means? It's yeah. not that I'm not interested in that. I am, but I'm, I may be more interested in like the development of scenes and where you came from and where you're going the kind of like the history of stuff. Um, I find that compelling. I want to know because there are all these little scenes that bubbled up over the United States in places like Minneapolis and Milwaukee and Cleveland and Cincinnati and other places that are never going to sort of have the reputation or attention of something like Osaka or London right. or Berlin or whatever. Uh, but you know, for the 50 to 150 people that care, um, it's worth preserving some of that history. For sure. And just moments ago, just as you're speaking here on the Discord, Ilka from Hare wrote, Ask Stefan when we can expect the next proper issue of New Forces Zine, please. Um, do you well, have any do you have any plans to to I mean I think the I think the one sheets are really cool. I think that's a nice way to you know, you can we've talked about it before, you kinda of mentioned that it's an easier way to just get something it was out a way there. To check and they're still doing it, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but do you have any plans to do like a, a, f a more full zine again anytime soon? No, no plans, but the, the, you know, the future is wide open. Yeah. Uh, you know, if I, if I, if I get a moment where I feel like there's people that need to be interviewed that haven't been interviewed and I feel like I'm not running myself ragged with my day job, then, then maybe. Um, but yeah, not, not for the immediate future. Mm -hmm. I'm glad people liked it. I'm kind of embarrassed by how the first few issues look, but I think the interviews are great. I think they are great. I think I think the thing about I don't know I I there's something that's very charming about noise releases that don't look super. <laughs> wah, even I mean you know like there's there's noise there's there's noise releases that I've to, I think I talked about it I talked about it recently with some of it like I I use self abuse as an example. Self abuse is like one of the best labels of all time in terms of curation and content and they have greatest, they have good artwork, but sometimes you look at their artwork or their layouts and you're like, that's kind of just like thrown together or that, you know, you kind of just get a kid's sense that, okay, this guy nece isn't necessarily like a, a graphic design guy, but it still has this honest and like direct, like functionality to it. And that, I like seeing, I like seeing the people's process over time. There's nothing wrong, and people tend to particularly like people that like sit down and like think, 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 think for six months, a year, two years, scheme it all up, and get everything. You know, this is how it's going to look forever and for all eternity. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Uh, but I also like seeing people that like get, you know, move to action and then just do it. Yeah. Right. And then as you, and then they keep doing it and then you sort of have to like catch up with yourself. Like, yeah. oh, sh oh crap, this thing that I thought was like impulsive, I'm actually getting deeper and deeper. And now I need to like bring the yeah. infrastructure and aesthetics up to date with it. Yeah. Um, I like, I like the impulsivity of that sometimes. And I don't For think sure. everything needs to be, you know, so incredibly calculated. Exactly. I think that's, I think that's really, I think it's really important and, and charming. And I think it's a lot of the best, best stuff starts out that way. And I think, I think it's also worse. I really don't like when the, how do we say it? The cart follows the ox in the other way, like where the, the presentation, the, the aesthetics, the, the marketing are the, the forefront and are really calculated. And then the, the content or the meat behind it is kind of lackluster. You right. Know? If, if it's so slick, but the sounds are unimpressive or something. Yeah. I think yeah. that happens a lot. And I, I, I'd much rather see the other way around. And there, to be fair, there's people whose like experience of this is probably eighty percent visual. I mean, there's people that just love the visual aspect, and that's fine. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I want both to be good. Yeah. Uh, but maybe sound is a little higher on the scale. Um, 
but yeah, I want, you know, you want things to, you want things to work together when they work together and you can feel it. And it's sometimes hard to quantify, uh, but yeah. when image and sound and idea, of course, are, are, uh, in harmony, that's the sweet spot. Yeah, of course. Um, what about a, like, a a book about the history of noise, like a, like a real one written by people who aren't just dry academics with a very limited scope yeah. and all aren't also just some random person who has some, I mean, there, I don't want to diss anyone, but there's been, there's been sort of attempts at it that's kind of like, Oh, this is going to be the book about noise. This is going to be the book about noise. And then you get a lot of, you get a mix of, of people that, writing an article about something that you know doesn't really have any relevance or no one cares about and you know it's like what about a book that's like an authoritative history of at least our general stream of yeah. noise history i don't know is it possible might be impossible i mean so i mean part of the thing here is that writing is hard in a particular skill and so yeah. Just because you do a label doesn't necessarily mean you can write. Right. Uh, and you're right. There's things that have kind of, you know, there's the new Hijo Kaidan book, Cato David Hopkins. Those are great. Yeah. There's the noise book that was published by Duke University Press. Uh, David, um, shoot, I'm forgetting his name. That book is interesting. I don't know. Uh, but it, 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 you know, it deploys a kind of sound studies apparatus that, I'm not aware of, and I found a little less compelling. I was I was grabbing on to like you know this is the history of the incapacitance. That's what I was yeah. you know trying to pull out of that. Yeah, you know I I think I know I, there's a Jeff German book that's coming out that I'm excited to get. That's cool. Um, I think I mean maybe you could do it. Maybe the move is to like make it really focused. Yeah. Um, I know that there are people working on books of more particular artists. Yeah. Uh, but weaving everything together seems like a challenge right because how far back do you go i mean there, there's people that would say you need to go to the 70s and the 60s or go to the 1920s right which is maybe correct but you know i think my interest probably starts in the 1980s personally right. yeah, yeah. I, I like john cage but like that's maybe where i'd want to pick up the story i don't know uh maybe someone should try maybe multiple people should try i want yeah, to read yeah. it i mean yeah it would need to be a lot of you know, a I have lot to, of people with a lot of skill and time. I have to write books for my day job, so I don't see it happening for me anytime soon. But maybe someday. I think I you so there are people that like do like interviewing some of these older heads is important, and that's also been happening. Yeah. Um, and so that's good, and people should do that. But yeah, I I I love these. I love I love having that history, and that's the tricky thing about noise because there's something charming and compelling about the the legends that surround noise yeah and the only way you get access to those is by showing up and being around and talking to people and then it's not just like right there right right i mean i don't want us to lose the process of having to dig into this and get obsessed with it and and chase all these tantalizing leads all over the place um i still don't think it would be i mean imagine if a lot of those legends that you kind of hear whispers of or were on message boards at one point imagine if some of those legendary stories and 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 happenings were just kind of compiled in a in a book it wouldn't be that it wouldn't be complete i don't i don't think it would ruin the mystery yeah, i think it would never could be complete it would just be like it would be my i mean it'd be mind-blowing and, f and fascinating yeah. and i think it would just whet everyone's appetite even more to just be like holy shit you know Cause i think yeah. there's, there's stuff that's gone on there that there is fan fantastic noise text happening. I mean, the Death Squad books are just yeah. like beyond good in execution. They're so good. I need to get the second one. First one's phenomenal. Yep. You know, there's several good long running sort of high gloss zines, noise receptor, yep. special interest. Yeah. Um, As like a lot I of said, thoughts, we'd love to have another one of those. That was yeah. that was a that was a close shot at, that came close to kind of that. I mean, it's still a magazine, but that came close to very phenomenal text. Yeah. 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 Yeah, the the, the textual stuff is great. People should keep making zines. Make your own zine. Yeah. Make a make a paper zine. Um I think people's excitement about Noise Widow, for example, who you had in the podcast, is yeah. indicative that there's appetite for written noise content. And particularly I think there's appetite for written noise content that does not recycle the kind of standard template, which to be fair was what I was doing with my zine, right? Which is where you interview people and do some reviews and but 
being more creative and interesting and trying to tap into some of that like magic that exists beyond the confines of just like the tape and the set. Yeah. Um, Noise Widow's doing that and more people should do stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's good to see. And I mean, I also, I, re I really liked in your zine the, the articles that you did that were kind of just like, those were the kind of creative moments, right? So I had a few articles where I was emailing noise record store owners randomly and being like, what's going on right now? So like I'd email Ron Lassard and being like, Ron, it's three o'clock on a Friday. What's up? And he's like, oh, I just put this Rita disc in an order for someone. And like some guy just came out off the street and bought a Tupac CD. And <laughs> that was fun. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the physical for record store, there's nothing like that. Uh, where Dead Gods in New York was so integral to when I lived in New York City, of course, and yeah. they're about to transition to something new here. Um, but having physical spaces, if you've got the capacity, you should go do that. Yeah, definitely. I think anyone who gives noise a physical space deserves, you know, at least a thumbs up because that's important for other people. It's really important for other people. So you lived in new york for new york city for i want to say three years three years, three years. Okay. I thought a little longer but um how does the experience in the with a noise scene in new york city differ from what you experienced in the midwest this is hard to answer because these things are so embedded in particular moments in time right like Comparing Minneapolis in 2010 to New York in 2019 is not the same as comparing Minneapolis in 2019 to New York in 2019. Right. You know what I mean? Um, I mean, there's particular things about New York. The amount of music infrastructure is so much bigger. Um, there's so many more artistic people and musical people. Uh, so, like, the pool of noise is bigger, but it's also more siloed. Whereas in a smaller city like the techno people and the sound art people and the free jazz people and the harsh noise person and the industrial person would all maybe get mismatched <laughs> together. They get more, you can get kind of in particular niches, I think in that city, it's so big. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, and is able to sustain like particular little niches, you know, like if you want to see a show that's just free jazz, you can just do that. Yeah. Um, so it's bigger, but maybe, a little bit more siloed, um, which is why the shows Thousands of Dead Gods were, did were so great because they made a pretty conscious effort to sort of reach their hand into, you know, particular little niches and pull people out and put them on shows. You know, the, the curation of Dead God shows in general was a reflection of that label, but the bills you could always count on being interesting and varied. Mm -hmm. um, you can't you can't overstate their their importance to. New York City since they've been active, mm -hmm. which I think was in a bit of a lull. Maybe this is just observing from a distance in speculation. People there might disagree. Oh, um, for sure it was. But like, particularly for like you know the world we live in, right? Like the kind of particular kind of noise terrain we occupy. They pulled that out of, I think, would, would fair to say a lull, um, and made for it sure. so that if, if you know if a good tour comes through, they can get a great show in New York City. Yeah. And obviously, you can't overemphasize the importance of that physical space. Um, yeah. that's, that spot was special, uh, and I was lucky to live there when I did. Saw a lot of good shows. You know, I lived there during COVID, so it wasn't ideal. I didn't get to do as much as I would have liked, but sure. Um, yeah, it's bigger. I don't know. Maybe easier to get lost. Sure. Harder, you know. You, you gotta force your way through all the figurative and literal static to get people to pay attention but that's true everywhere i mean yeah. the person that's off in the middle of nowhere in iowa has the same kind of problem yeah right if you don't have access to a local scene how do you get people to pay attention i do also think it's worth connecting or or, or drawing attention to the fact that justin and matt I mean, Matt's from Virginia, right? I mean, that's I, that doesn't really count as the Midwest, but Justin is really, like, from the Midwest. They're both products of sort of these, like, small, early 2000s noise scenes where a lot of local U.S. tours would come through. Yeah, and Justin was he heavily active and super fanatical in that Matt time. You know? lived it too. Matt lived at a famous venue called America. and Exactly, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, they they, they both have this, like, 
the roots in I think like that kind of like smaller town Midwest noise enthusiasm. Yeah, the roots go deep, and it takes a while. You know, I mean, <laughs> John, we said this to me once. It takes about ten years for people to really pay attention to what you're doing. Yeah, like it takes a little bit. You know. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, not to get too motivational speaker, but if you feel like no one's, it, it, it doesn't happen like that. I mean, it happens like that for a handful of people, usually people yeah. that have cool friends or whatever. And that's, that's just life. That's how the world works. But for in general, like just, uh, persistence and trying to, you know, do excellent stuff is how you get some attention that plus time. Exactly. That's a good, that's a good thing for people to remember. Cause and you, need, you need to seek out in-person interaction and, and personal interaction, right? That can't be overstated. Yeah. There's a lot of people that are frustrated that things aren't happening for them yet. I, but I, I, think- I, I always wonder if that's true. Cause I have that thought in my head too. And I think maybe I have that thought in my head because I do get all these emails of people that are like spamming their demo around. You catch it. You catch it more being a, doing a label. I catch it during the podcast. You know, I, I talk to a lot of people about stuff, and I do I do hear I do I do pick that up on from a certain amount of people that you know people are like, well, how? But you know, I, I, how do I get involved, or what? How do labels get into my stuff? And sometimes the answer is just you just go and do it. Yeah, and it takes some time. It doesn't happen quick. I mean, yeah, sometimes it happens quick, but yeah. it's not going to necessarily happen quick. And you got to be also good. That's the one thing. I think that's the one un- unfortunate thing that people don't tell people and don't really like also put emphasis on in their own work or what they do is like being good is also like <laughs> the most important part. <laughs> you know, just wanting to do it and being involved isn't necessarily going to gonna make it happen. Like, you got to bring quality and for quality, you might need a lot of time and work. Yeah. It's just, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, and it, it's, it's a funny genre in one sense. It's so radically subjective. Um, but at the same time in my head, I do have like, you know, things I think are good and things that I think are not good. Of course. Or I'll see sets and go, that was not a good set. Yeah. And sometimes I can't quantify exactly why sometimes I can, but, um, yeah, early on, I, <laughs> Some some older head, there's some conversation, and someone goes, "Is there such a bad thing as a is there such a thing as a bad noise set?" And they said, "There absolutely is such a thing yeah. as a bad noise set." People need to people need to remember that. I think in there, I mean, I but also like the, the encouraging. The beautiful twist, of course, is that there's people that love the bad set, right? Right, that they're see, they're seeking out that chaos and failure and in disaster. Um, or like trying to ride that razor's edge. So there's no, there's no, there's no easy sort of answers or, or pulls here, which is one of the great things about the genre. Yeah. Do you think um, regional scenes or cities, maybe large? I don't know how this maybe varies large versus small, um, are typically self-sufficient enough that if the people who maybe are kind of responsible for say putting on shows or kind of gluing the scene together if they stop that there are people that are going to kind of naturally take over i mean it depends i think it's oftentimes when that person stops things do go into a lull i mean these things often aren't seamless like i can think like for example when egan bud of xiphoid dementia left boston it's like you didn't hear much from boston for a while it felt like um you know when you and i left the twin cities and then sam and joe slowed down you didn't hear much from the Twin Cities for a little bit. And then other people made something new. Um, I think that's the thing you need to appreciate about this is that there's usually like a, a handful of people keeping things on life support. Uh, and so when you lose those people, sometimes good things can disappear. Um, unless you take and like you step up and take over. Unless you step up and take over. And so, you know, be appreciative of the people that are making things happen where you are because it's easy to complain about stuff, but it's a thankless. I mean, the booking in particular is such a thankless job. Yeah. For sure. But yeah, you got to get get out and tour. Is it Matt Becky quote? Only touring makes it real. Which I know there's studio-only projects, right? But... Yeah, I mean, I, I, I like, I like the sentiment of that of that statement for sure, but I, I think that's maybe not 
one hundred percent true, but it's, it's it's definitely has some. It definitely has some. It's definitely not one hundred percent true, but I think it's a good sentiment because I think it makes you better. For sure, and the the experience of the live show, bar none, I think is the most important. One, I think it's the most important thing for me. Yeah, like my ability to go see good live shows. That's when you lose that. It's bad. Yeah. You talked a little bit about starting out your your noise projects, and I I don't know if you actually mentioned it by name, but your your original project was breaking the will, mm-hmm. which is still active. Yeah, still active. It's kind of it seems on it's not it's not in the forefront, but it's but you still you still put stuff out by it often or every once in a while, and it's and it's, and it's, and it's great. I mean, it's it's an awesome project, and it's yeah, I, I was sort of perpetually dissatisfied with it for almost the entire duration. And then maybe in the last couple of years, I feel like a little less dissatisfied. Um, but yeah, in the last it, it couple years, it's gotten really good. Like those, those, those handful of releases that have come out have been like top notch. Less, uh, less active, but it's still there. It'll, it'll be back. Yeah. So tell me about your main project, what I would call your main project. Um, Joe's dead. Yeah. And how, so, so how do you pronounce it? I say just add. Uh huh. Um, it's the name of a lake in Minnesota. Is that how yeah. they pronounce it? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, Minnesota is populated by Norwegian immigrants, so it's probably more like Yosta. Mm-hmm. My sister lived in Norway for a while. She said that's probably what it is, but people can pronounce it however they like. I'm, I'm, even with the I K? I, I always say Kjostad. Even with the K, they say Yosta, I guess. Uh-huh. I don't mm-hmm. know. There's, if Lassie Marhog watches this, he can maybe correct. Yeah, I was just thinking that. I can ask him. But yeah, okay. Uh, but so, just, just dead. Yeah, perhaps about just like dead. yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've been doing Breaking Them for so long and felt like I was sort of productively ch- chasing something. I don't know. Uh, it was the, the original recordings were on a whim, random experiments that I just did with no thought to what they might be. Uh,. And then it was kind of liberating to break out of that thing I'd been chasing for a decade or whatever it had been at that point with breaking the will. Um, and then one tape became two, and then the next thing you know, it's off and running. I mean, just has been interesting because I think since it first emerged, people have been trying so hard to like quantify what it is they like they want to know what it is in like relation to what i do like oh it's stefan's software project yeah. or it's stefan's tape project or it's yeah. stefan's field recording project and it's kind of been a whole bunch of different things over time uh that i don't necessarily put in any kind of like not trying to like make it my tape music project or whatever right. for example um, it was just kind of interesting watching people try to make sense of what it was. It's a noise project. It's a noise project. Um, that if, if, if we say anything about it, it maybe puts an emphasis on particular sounds from particular places, but even that isn't a hard and fast rule and, 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 and can change. So, but talk about the concepts or the themes behind it. Cause that's, that is a very, very unique aspect of it. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, the, there's like a particular lake in northern Minnesota where I am when I go home to visit family, uh, which I think it's just sort of dawned on me that like the recording possibilities there were so rich that if I like made that the focus, that could create the structure for a lot of art for a long time, like yeah. exploring a particular place and how it sounds, but then also leaving it free to reinterpret that sound years down the line with different machines and electronics and so on. Um, and so, you know, early releases, it was a lot of like wandering around and trying to find sounds, right? Um, seeing, seeing what a more natural landscape sounds like, seeing what the stuff that are there sound like. My thinking on this has evolved over time. And I think the most recent CD music for organic performance is because I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not like a, I don't, I don't think like an artist, like I don't. I feel like I'm just a dog chasing cars. Like it's just all instinctual. I'm like, just like chasing ideas or feelings, you know, mm-hmm. like I don't have like these overarching conceptual things that I like scheme up and then apply. I'm just like, it's all very instinctual. And so it dawned on me that the kind of transition that's been happening is that rather than like wandering around and try to find a sound, 
you can actually treat the environment as the instrument and play it and record that. And so I've been trying to like also almost do these like mini performances for myself with the stuff that's around and record that. And then that becomes the source material that's then used later to make bigger, richer recordings. So like not, it's not, it's not like a process of collection so much, which is what it was for a long time. It's more a process of performance and then performance again, mm -hmm. and then filtering, filtering, filtering. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's like, that's a, a change that was happening that hadn't dawned on me. And then I finally realized that that was actually what I was doing. And so I've been enjoying that process. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, the, the different albums are different. I'm trying, it's, it's liberating to try different things. It's going to keep evolving. Uh, but in some ways it's remarkably selfish in that the process is trying to capture a particular feeling that really only I've experienced. Uh, but if that is interesting to other people, that's great. Has it ever been a challenge to incorporate an idea that you have or a feeling that you want to, or the feeling that you have from the environment that you're in and have this connection to, to translate that to a sound or a composition that is sonically engaging for you? Do you ever struggle with that or have to fight with the sound sources? Not really, because it's so it's so process based. I mean, concept maybe isn't even the right word. Like I'm interested in the translation of what I'm feeling, seeing, hearing, experiencing through the recording process. And so I want things to get mangled and changed and repurposed and readapted through that process. Uh, and so there's less of me trying to find like one to one translation. This is what it sounded like. Let's make it sound like that over here. Mm -hmm. Like I want the kind of alchemy to happen. Mm -hmm. But I think in general with recording and maybe, I don't know, haven't played much in bands, but particularly in noise maybe, right? I mean, the happy accidents are the moments where you get the most traction. Right. Um, it's difficult to think something and try to do it. Sometimes it works. But I think the best stuff is often you're not trying to do it. It happens. And then you got to have the wherewithal to be like, okay, that was good. Let me chase that moment a little bit. Yeah. Really noise, right? I mean, the happy accidents, that's where you want to be with noise, especially with recording. Some little idiosyncrasy of the electronics or the sound of the machine that opens up possibilities. You got to be able to chase those moments. Um, and so with Just Ed, it's a lot of like gathering, accumulating sounds and sounds and sounds. And then those aren't just what ends up on tape, right? Or, cassette or CD or whatever. Uh, things are worked on quite heavily in most cases. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. Just that dissatisfied maybe isn't the right word. It's more like being open to the changes that happen and, and the, and then the accidents of process, uh, and letting those, because it's, it's hard, right? Because if you, if something happens, you're not trying to do, sometimes you can't see it for what it is at that moment. Yeah. But being able to see this wasn't what I was trying to do, but this is going to easily be better yeah. than what I was trying to do. Um, do you, you have any rules in your that. process? No, no rules. I mean, imposing rules can be useful, but in general, no. Um, I would say I'm the most productive. I'm getting ready to play shows. Thinking about how I'm going to realize something live also pushes the sort of strict recording process forward. Um, and so it's no coincidence that a lot of the just at full length albums grew out of attempts to put together pieces for performances. Um, Another question someone submitted, which I think is maybe a pretty obvious question, but I'd love to hear Stefan go deep on his latest release, Music for Organic Performance. Is it my imagination, or did he really record the performances in a rural setting? So, yes and no. I mean, a lot of the, set, a lot of the raw exoskeleton of that album is stuff that was recorded with a handheld field recorder on location. Um, but none of those are simply on the CD. Everything's been heavily, uh, repurposed through machines and tapes and electronics and so on. Um, but they're correct. The question is correct in that this CD was me fully realizing a shift that had been happening, which was a shift from, let me go out and collect a bunch of stuff and then just use it later to, let me go out and do like my own private performances for myself and like let those be 
more fully incorporated into the recording process as opposed to just like picking little things and, mm -hmm. and, and, and having them exist completely abstracted. Um, so there's, there's moments and sounds on that album that are allowed to unfold for a longer duration or are more fully there in their original sense. Um, yeah, the CD is, it's, it's, it's a, it's a bit of a change in process or maybe realizing the change in process that had been happening. Um, that there was maybe something unproductive about just like going out and cataloging sounds for use later, but like actually trying to perform the environment itself. Mm -hmm. What kind of feedback have you gotten from people in terms of like the, the nature element of your work? I mean, that's pe many people are very passionate about, you know, if they're outdoorsmen or if they're into nature like that, they're very, very passionate about it. So have you, have you gotten some, some meaningful or, or specific connections or feedback about that element of the work? Not as much as you think, actually. I don't know. People seem to just buy stuff and move on a little bit. <laughs> uh, you know, I've had some interesting conversations with Jeff German. He's yeah. obviously, you know, the, the, the richness of his history of doing this kind of thing, you know, I'm a, you know, drop in the ocean compared to like the amount of time he spent thinking about what things sound like outside and capturing those sounds and his relation to nature. Um, it's funny because Eric Nystrand refers to a lot of what I do as like rural noise. The irony being that I've been living in cities for the duration of Jostad. I mean, there've been a few places I've lived that were in proximity to less urban areas, but I mean, there's maybe something productively ironic or in tension about realizing these recordings in a place like New York City, which just like overbearingly uh, constricts you into this place that feels so unnatural. Yeah. Um, and so in some ways, maybe just that was a way to escape that a little bit. Um, but, you know, there's a, a environmental thinker named Bill Cronin I really like, who one of his big, big arguments is that the problem with nature as we think about it is wilderness. In other words, like wilderness is that thing over there where no one is and you got to go find it and do it. And if you think about it that way, you don't see like the tree or the bush or the plant that's like right around you all the time every day and see yourself in relation to that, right? Yep. You're sort of abstracted from the nature that exists all around you all the time. Mm -hmm. um, it strikes me that there may be some connection, right, to the kind of John Cage thing about listening, right? That, yeah. Like you sequester something off into music and then you stop listening to the interesting stuff that's going on all around you all the time. Um, you know, maybe that's the trouble with wilderness is you abstract it to this thing over there that you can only go if you take a vacation there. Uh, and then you lose track of the nature that's all around you all the time that you exist in a relationship to. So do you think just had could ever be transformed or evolve towards the city, so to speak? I mean, it doesn't exist outside of it, you know, and the, the, in terms the of where you, where you reach from, where you, where you, yeah. there, there's, there's sounds on Joseph recordings that are from urban places and basically every, yeah, it's, it, there's, it's not really a strict rule. Um, you know, in some ways that can be a productive kind of tension. Um, but yeah, just as going to keep evolving to be whatever it needs to be. Uh, I don't think like it'll ever conceptually be about the city, but you know, any conceptual stuff with just that is very, uh, I don't know. I don't want that to be overbearing. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of the, some of the recordings are more narrative, like warlord is kind of narrative, but, um, I want people to kind of be able to make up their own story about it and not just have a narrative imposed on them. What is Warlord about? It's interested in like violence and uh, less developed parts of the United States and their relationship to the way people kind of fetishize like a coming climate crisis. Like we'll all be living in some kind of Mad Max post post climate change wasteland, which I don't necessarily think is what's going to happen, but there's this weird thing. And this has been true of the in, kind of like 
the history of environmentalism and environmental movement that's like fetishized the end of the world um, and enjoys predicting the end of the world, right? For a long time, it was the kind of, you know, there's too many people on the earth, that discourse, right. which can be very troubling. Um, and then it was, you know, we're all going to die very soon. Peak oil is going to happen. My confidence in capitalism's ability to adapt to crisis is pretty high. I think, you know, we could run this planet into the ground and then you'll be, you know, working in an Amazon on Mars. So, uh, but yeah, I'm just, I'm interested in the, the fixation on something people don't want to happen. Mm-hmm. Which in some ways is productive because, I mean, I personally believe that climate change is a real thing and that there's a lot of ways industrial societies are set up that are horrifying and uh, contributing to that process and accelerating that process. Um, you know, I think and write a lot about things like oil and natural resources and so on. So, but again, I want all that stuff to be very kind of latent in Joe's dead and a light touch. Um, I want people to be able to tap into the sounds and kind of have their own experience with it. Have you and Jeff ever talked about a collaboration? No. I mean, would I be interested? Sure, can, hypothetically, but he's a busy guy. I don't want to... I'm more... <laughs> as a fan, I'm more interested in, like, Jeff's own stuff than anything I might impose on Jeff, mm-hmm. to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we're keeping plenty busy with this archival project. For sure. Um, what about other projects of yours that people might... Yeah, I mean, we talk quite a bit about action discipline on the first podcast. Yeah. Um, you know, certainly miss playing live with Brad. Uh, so the, you know, the two main ones I do now would be form hunter and cryocene, excuse me, um, form hunters with Weston Zerkes of Ithaca, New York mm-hmm. he runs the label prime rune, various projects, sunken cheek, magnetic corner, goddaughter, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Weston's a dear friend, but I think I can say objectively, uh, a criminally underrated American noise artist. Yeah. And pe- people like what he does, but I think more people could and should. Yeah. He's tucked away up there in upstate New York, a little out of sight, out of mind sometimes, I think. But um, pretty, pretty the stuff he does with tape, I think, is so phenomenal. And and he, he does he does get some respect, but I think you should check out Weston's stuff if you haven't. Yeah. But anyway, I lived in Ithaca for a few years, upstate New York, and so... One of the things noise does is it gives you friends in all these random places. And so I had uh, Weston and his wife, Kate, who's the noise widow, Mm -hmm. uh, are good friends of mine. And so Weston and I started this project, um, Form Hunter. And it kind of, there's this very productive tension at the core of Form Hunter, which is like me trying to constantly push it into the realm of like ignorant blasting and Weston trying to pull it back towards like more kind of tapey, atmospheric. Mm-hmm. Um, and in, in, in that conflict is where I think the the, the, the good stuff of Form Hunter happens. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, in general, it pushes more towards the harsh noise side of things, but I like when he finds moments to rein, it, rein us in a little bit. Mm-hmm. The interlude, or not the interlude, the middle short track on the Tronics and Helicopter CD is a good example of that. Mm-hmm. Um it's a lot of fun. We uh, use a lot of scrap metal and found found materials, amplify those. Uh, it's a place where I get to tap into a particular kind of noise, live chaos that I don't so much get with Just Dead, which is very calculated. It's not fully, ca- I mean, I'm not hitting playing a recorder and sitting back. I think you need a good live set needs some things that aren't planned, some room for experimentation because noise live is so variable every sound system every set you like if you go on tour you'll find that the set is going to be different every single night because every space is different and noise gear is particularly susceptible to those differences and so you need to leave room for you to like discover what's going to be good about that particular night and chase it because it's going to be something different every time right your contact mic is going to do something different um that feedback is going to be different. This switch is going to have a totally different reaction. Like you need to have space built into your set to like find those unique, perfect moments and chase them. 
Um, but in general, Joe Stead's a little bit more playing, whereas Form Hunter, like, you get to embrace the kind of violent chaos of a very physical live performance. Yeah. Um, you know, it's the live set that's more prone to injury. Uh, and, um, you know, we did, we did a set for Summer Scum this year that began with us sawing an amplified tape deck in half, but trying to stop short of getting electrocuted, which we succeeded. No one got hurt. That was good. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's 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 leaning into some of the spectacle of live noise, which I think yeah. sometimes people, uh, d- despite the love for incapacitants, like don't they they uh, underestimate the value of sure. putting on a good putting on a good show, yeah, um, having a really physical, enthusiastic show, something you can kind of lose yourself in as a performer. I mean, performing with four hundred is interesting because I'm often on the mixer, so I have to like have my brain divided in half. And like, there's one half that just lets loose, but there needs to be a half that's like paying really careful attention to the levels and yeah. how things sound and whether things are broken. I like the the challenge of that is kind of entertaining to like go nuts, but like have some coherent corner of your mind that can like step back and observe it from a distance somehow. Cool. But yeah, so four hundred I do with Weston. Uh, most recent thing is the CD on Tronics and Helicopter yep. called Violent Adaptation. Um, you should check that out. Came out. Boy, when did that come out? Was that COVID year, 2020, 2021? I think 2021 or 2020 for sure. Yeah, one of those two years. It was a, it's a busy time for noise releases, so maybe yeah. some people missed it. But I would say that's, if you if you want to check us out, I think that's maybe the best thing we've done. Awesome. Um, we've got an LP and a CD on Found Remains I'm pretty proud of. A series also of tapes. Really, yeah. Of course, a tape on White Centipede. Yep. Um, we're working on a CD that'll come out on new forces in 2023. Excellent. Killer. But, um, yeah, form hunter, harsh noise. The, the, for summer scum, we got one of those big, I, I had form hunter is also a place where I can like live out my bad ideas, which is nice. Um, and so one of my silly ideas was I wanted this banner to play live with, uh, <laughs> Which, you know, people do. It's not the weirdest thing. Maybe noise cool. bands yeah. do less often. But we've got this... The first tape has this great image that Weston's friend Trevor took of Weston with a gun, a rifle, with his head sort of, like, cut off or whatever. Yeah. Yet it's on the cover of the first tape. I wanted a banner of that that said Form Hunter. And so we were looking into it. It was like, should we get someone to screen print it? And that didn't wasn't going to happen. And so we ordered this banner. Uh perhaps not thinking through exactly what the dimensions meant. So we ended up with this like Ozfest size festival stage banner <laughs> that weighed, I don't know how much it weighed. It was so heavy. And so when we, we played summer scum in New York city this summer, you know, going to New York city to play a fest is crazy and stressful and you can worry about your set or whatever. My only concern the whole weekend was whether and how we were going to successfully hang this banner. Like, I didn't care how the set went. I just we, I was so committed to this, like, stupid banner concept. Um, and we, we managed to, like, hang it off these pipes, and it hung down all the way across the stage, and it looked really cool. At least I think it did, which is the only thing that matters. So yeah. we got this banner hung. Of course, you know, my lovely friends who... My friends in New York developed this rhythm of roasting me really hard every time I played a set. Uh-huh. I don't know. I... I, I I tend to think I'm relatively humble, but maybe they they needed to make sure I wasn't getting need to. So I, I they tend to they tend to roast me after my performances, okay. and apparently one of the stage lights made it look like it said Foam Hunter. <laughs> so we were Foam Hunter for the next few weeks. That's great. Maybe we need to just do an album called Foam Hunter. For, yeah. Foam Hunter. By Foam Hunter. But <laughs> yeah, I I love I love uh love performing with Weston. You got to have him on the podcast. You've had his wife, but yeah, I will. I definitely will. So yeah, that's Form Hunter. Um, harsh noise, uh, and then Cryocene is the newest thing I've been doing. So Cryocene I do with Matt Becky of Scant and Thousands of Dead Gods. Um, again, Matt's just a, a good friend, and I think there's nothing wrong with sort of like slamming collaborations into place with all your friends all the time. But I think with Cryocene, mm-hmm. we un- we recognize that there is a particular opportunity there, which is that Matt's genius lies in synth sounds and kind of deep bass mm-hmm. droning elements. A part of my, this sort of outside the bounds of what I do entirely, actually. 
um, and, and, and vice versa, right? So I think we recognize that bringing some of our approaches together might yield something interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it has. So we did the one CD on New Forces, Exclave. Uh, mm-hmm. And we've got recordings that are going to be the next the next uh, Cryosing full length in 2023 I'm excited about. Cool. Um, we finally got to do it live right before I left New York City. We opened for Black Leather Jesus. Oh, good. I, I thought I on. saw that, that. I thought I saw that you guys had a performance that maybe got canceled or? Yeah, so we were going to play a show in New York on Halloween in. 20 i guess it would have been 2021 yeah dead gods were setting up this secret show in prospect park in brooklyn oh uh got rained out damn so unfortunately got canceled um but yeah made it happen live set went great so excited to do that from time to time with matt and there'll be new recordings coming um yeah trying to really tap into the kind of the deep listening of matt's uh palette with um something a little more tactile with yeah. what i do great city those things together. yeah i'm pleased with how it turned out and for a first attempt I'm, I'm excited to see how we can kind of continue to evolve it and, and and how it's going to evolve now because the first two recordings are going to be us living in the same city mm-hmm. um but not you know not interested in the project dying so when you move these things into a more distant kind of relationship, interesting things can happen. So we'll, we'll see yeah. how it continues to evolve. Cool. Any solo projects that we don't know about? No, just keeping busy with just that. I, I, you know, I'll get the urge to do breaking the wall again. It's been kind of quiet. Mm-hmm. I think next time I get asked to do a show, maybe that'll be a good time to dust the gear out. I, I left New York city and I live in Western Massachusetts now, which has its own long, rich history of noise activity mm-hmm. um i'm a little far i'm 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 close enough to to go to but a little bit far away from cold spring hollow which mm-hmm. is kind of the the spot in western massachusetts um and has been for a long time right people like dan green would have diagram may affiliated right. with it um eric brown has called him julia spots of matriarch sam hadge uh um, plenty of other people whose name yeah. i'm forgetting um, but so there's stuff going around and going on in Western Massachusetts, um, cool. that people should be paying attention to. So I do get to still see play and, and check out the occasional show. Um, and, uh, yeah. Tell me about your collection. I do like to collect music. Um, I don't know. In all the and all the and all the, the 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 good and bad senses of that, I'm kind of obsessed with collecting stuff, um, because I want to hear it and experience it, kind of with the immediacy that goes along with that. Yeah, and I just fetishize having stuff. Yeah, right. I mean, it's not <laughs> it's it's not the most reasonable thing in the world. It doesn't need to be. I'm just obsessed with getting some of this yeah. stuff. I like the chase, which uh, I think is very normal. People always like to talk about like that that's the like that's the most evil thing in the world but it's like it's not it's not it's not that bad i mean i don't think it's the most evil thing in the world and even if we decide it's a negative it's like that's fine yeah it can be it can be the negative side of my personality yeah (laughs) um so yeah i like to collect stuff i like to collect noise cassettes um constantly chasing them uh how has that changed over the past few years for you has it has it gotten gotten crazier no, I mean, I think in general things got. Any, you know, I, I am interested in all kinds of other music too, um, and I think things in general got more expensive during the pandemic, in part because mm-hmm. people had money, or maybe more money than they tended to have, and they were at home. Yeah, um, and we felt the impact of that with the labels too. I mean, in 2020, right. and someone on a recent podcast talked about this, right? Just the absolute flood of material that came out. Yeah. 2020 to 2021 was the combination of a few things, right? It was people having a little bit, in some cases, not all cases, right? I know some people had a really hard time, but some people had a little extra money. Uh, People were at home. They had an appetite to hear stuff. Um, They maybe had an appetite for like music at home as opposed to kind of just the on the go flippant listening of the phone. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it's fair to say that impacted like more collectible stuff too. I mean, certainly like higher 
luxury like hardcore punk records it, they, they got really expensive i felt like during the pandemic uh-huh. um but yeah i like i like tracking stuff down i like it's 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 like a kind of historical investigation I like seeing the history of some of the stuff that like the 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 smelling the dusty yeah. mildewy residue of something that was created long before i was paying attention to what's going on yeah right it's you, you, it's not like you're pretending you were there for it, but it's like you're getting the barest glimpse of something that you wish you could have experienced that didn't. Um, I'm, inter- I'm interested in having those little moments of history and getting yeah. to experience them in some kind of way that, you know, a, a MP3 blog can't replicate. Yeah. And it's so finite. I mean, I don't know. I don't necessarily think noise is growing or will grow, but I think it might be growing a bit. I mean, but like the the, the fact that, you know, if there's something that was 50 copies in... 1994 you gotta imagine that over those years that's just gonna dwindle down from you know yeah they're not gonna leave people's collections or you know people will kind of move on and without putting them back in circulation it's yeah, the way the world yeah. way, way, way the world goes and so um but yeah i think i you know i like to get collectible stuff there's also value in reissuing things I don't think everything needs to be reissued, but I think there have been a lot of great reissues that have made things available to people that weren't, and that's yeah. that's less, that's a good thing. Yeah, and you've been doing that too, which is very cool. I asked you last time we talked, you know, I asked them in their top five of all time and top five new, and you gave me a list. I won't subject you to the exact same thing this time, but can you show me your top five personal i don't know if you're in your collection or how easy this will be can you talk show me like five release that you have in your personal collection that are like your prized possessions you basically want me to show off yeah exactly all right i can as long as everyone understands that this was oscar's idea (laughs) and you know i think it's great that you collect stuff like that i think it's you know people like jim or whatever i mean it's about you know in the moment, I feel like it's about maybe hoarding it for yourself or having it in your collection. But I, I would hope that's like also s- someday there really does exist like a like a museum or something like that, like a you know a while the opportunity ago. for these things to be really preserved and you know not that just okay in thirty years or fifty years when all of, all of us die out that you know most of the tapes are just kind of in boxes in everyone's house and just kind of get. I need to look into that question. Cause I feel like there was a moment maybe at the end of the contradict soundboard where Ron Lassard took his entire personal collection and wanted to donate it. And I think it got to the point where he was in talks to donate it to the university of California at Berkeley. And I don't know if that happened. I should email Ron. Wow. It's like that was, that was like happening as the noise board imploded. So maybe that story kind of got lost, but yeah, there's, I, you know, you know, like Luke Taney a couple of times has done, I don't even call him, like made his, I mean, he makes his record store a gallery from time to time, but he's put on display yeah. noise releases, Yeah, which are art objects, like a hundred percent. I mean, the four shrines, that's a, that's a piece of art. Absolutely. All that stuff is. All, I mean, it, all it is. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Very cool. Um, what else? is coming up soon for new forces or for you what what do you got going on in the next few months things going on things are going on uh been it can be hard to I think new forces like scaled up a little bit and it got hard to balance work life against the label so i'm trying to trying to walk that edge in a way that's sustainable um but there's exciting things coming up i've had a phenomenal Joe Colley LP in production that's just been hammered by vinyl delays mm. and by the you know they were like oh 10 to 12 months which is bad but was yeah. everything was that bad when I submitted it and by the end it's going to be like 18 months wow so, Joe if you watch this I'm so so very sorry it's out of my control but I still feel so bad yeah. it's too long yeah. it's too long for to come too out. Long. it's too long but the material is phenomenal. So yeah. for all of you that really enjoyed the Total Black LP that Joe Colley did this year, uh, you're going to love this too. So mm-hmm. check it out when it comes out. I'm hoping February. 
please. Uh, other things in the works. Uh, phenomenal Shredded Nerve CD that'll cool. be coming out in early 2023, which really, I think we're going to be able to sort of mark in the, the trajectory of Justin's career. This is like a new interesting moment. Cool. Um, very psychedelic uh, CD. So look for that. It's going to have great art, great sounds. I'm excited about that one. Um, CD by Commuter Jackson yep. from Open Portland. Yep. Uh, his CD, his CD, Inner Southeast Industrial. People seem to really like. Yeah, it's very good. 2021, 2020, recent recent CD. I think 2021. On Phage, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, so follow up to that. It's very good. I think people are going to like it. Uh, and then there's going to be cryo scene and form hunter CDs. Uh, I, you know, one of my rules is to try to not release things after Thanksgiving because it gets a little too crazy with the holidays, but I do have brand new releases that are out that people that are making their way to distros as we speak. So I hope people exactly. check those out. Uh, new CDs by Joe Stad, which is of course me, uh, Kyle Flanagan, who is a kind of New York city guy that, people are getting a sense of, and I think the CD is going to people that don't have access to the like limited tapes, the CD is going to open their eyes to someone who's doing as interesting noise as anyone's doing right now. Yep. Um, the CD is called, uh, Hey man, cut himself loose. Yep. Uh, it's phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've seen it on a lot of, um, you know, year end best list and that just came out. Justifiably. So, yeah. um, and then a CD for shanked, which is plague mother and skin graft. That's right. Angry Cleveland harsh noise. Uh, and then a big 40th anniversary uh, three CD box set for uh, Industrial Legends Hunting Lodge. Yep. Um, which this this 2022 this is the 40th anniversary, so it badly needed to come out this year. So I kind of stepped in to help that make that happen. Inspire material. They just did an interview on Noise Extra. You should check out. Yep. It kind of boggles the mind. I mean, they're making those sounds in the early 80s, and I don't yep. get it. It's like so far ahead. Yeah. Um, really inspiring. In the duration I've been trying to make sound, I've had a billion and one things I could intentionally or unintentionally enter my brain and influence what I'm doing. Like they're yeah. conjuring this stuff out of I don't know what. Yeah. Um. So those those are kind of brand new as this podcast comes out, and then there's other things coming up. Uh, a second round of the Richard Ramirez '90s cassette reissues. Great. Uh, hit a few snags in terms of finishing or getting access to all the art I need. So mm -hmm. trying to like do that justice archivally speaking. Um, so, but it's all mastered and sounds phenomenal. It's got very cool liner notes. I'm excited for people to, to bring that to fruition. Uh, Hands 2 that I mentioned. Yep. Um, and then another archive project with Evil Moisture. Oh, great. Bringing together some of the harder to stuff, harder, harder to get stuff that he, Andy's done. Great. Um, and then, you know, there's always kind of things bubbling up. Um, but yeah, uh, we'll try to try to stay busy with new forces. And of course, really appreciate everyone that checks this stuff out. Excellent. All right, Stefan. Well, I really appreciate it. It was fun talking to you. Thanks for stopping by the last uh, video party, which was a lot of fun. That's always fun. I don't know. You, I don't know. Sometimes... Uh, and I, I, I'm sympathetic to the fact that a lot of those guys, there's English is not their first language and English is their English is better than my Finnish or German or yeah. whatever. So, but yeah, it was nice to see people talking a little bit, <laughs> talking a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's, it's nice to make those connections. I mean, I, I, uh, I, I sort of maybe weirdly haven't had the chance to tour Europe yet. I need to make that happen. Um, I want to get over there and play some shows. So. Um, There's good folks over, over here. Get over there and meet some of those people. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I think touring, booking an international tour has remained somewhat tenuous, but hopefully, pretty soon, the risk there will decrease and can make that happen. Yeah. I mean, it seems like a lot of people are trying to come through this this spring. You know. I mean, the 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 pandemic did things to everything obviously that's the most facile statement ever but like particularly the experience of noise and the touring experience right uh, i don't know it'll be interesting to see what kind of infrastructure comes back because a lot of it just like went away right. and now you're having to reinvent a system right yeah. 
I mean, for me, the the start of the pandemic is always going to be indelibly linked to noise touring because these these flyers I have behind me are the original collages for Justin Lake's art flyers yeah. that he's made. Yeah. So these are, these are the originals of shows I played, but this one right here is the flyer for the Shredded Nerve Joe Stad tour that was going to happen. Let's see. So March thirteenth, mid March, twenty twenty. Yeah. So the first date was a day in Detroit that Mike Colino was going to do. Yeah. And that show was canceled by Mike the day before, which was the first moment where I was like, oh, this is something. Right. Like, I remember that week wandering around Manhattan trying to get hand sanitizer yeah. because I felt like, oh, I should maybe have some hand sanitizer on the yeah. tour and couldn't get any. Right? right. And then, like, within 24 hours, it went from, like, this, like, weird news story to like yeah. very i mean new york city locked down right yeah. and like people For really, it was, it was intense know. very quick the start of that is going to be linked to the shredded nerve just had tour that never got to happen unfortunately it seems like people are hitting it pretty hard nowadays and i mean from what cologne i'm still i still don't really have a good venue here and i'm not, I'm not like i like you said i mean booking shows is a thankless thankless project and I kind of hate doing it. Putting on tours that talk about thanklessness or uh, yeah. festival, festivals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so the I kind of have not really put a lot of energy into. I've set up a few shows here some years ago that were pretty good, varyingly well attended, but some some quite good. But it's just not where my energy lies, and the city is not. It's very conservative. It's very conservative in the sense of just being like, if you go around to the kind of smaller DIY-ish venues and talk about a noise show, people are like not, they don't, they're not with it. So, yeah. but at the same time, there's some really good acts, friends from the States that want to come through like all this, this coming spring. So me and me and Sisto, Rossi, who lives here are like, all right, we need to get her together. That's great. Yeah. Sisto lives here. That gives you someone else to like, have one more cook in the kitchen, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's going to happen too because everyone's trying to come through like right when my babies do. Right. So, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll yeah, get yeah, a yeah, show set up. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'm, I, I'm, 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 I'm motivated though because there's, you know, acts I can't well, miss and people I want to yeah, make sure that. Germany's a big country. It'd be nice to not just have Berlin as the option. Yeah. It's on the other side. I mean, it's like. Yeah. Six, it's like fully other side. It's not like, yep. it's not like if you're living in Cologne and there's a show in Berlin, you're going to be like, oh, let's yeah. just like hop in the car and drive like right. an hour or two. It's like, you don't do that really. So, yeah, it does need to happen here. So I'm, well, I'm hoping we can make at some happen. point. Hopefully, I'll be coming through. You know, I want to do Europe and Scandinavia and maybe the UK. So I want to go to Japan really bad. Yeah, those are all things to, to do be, for need, sure. Need to, need to make that happen. Yeah. Well. I, I'm sure you will. And uh, again, thanks again for talking. And uh, thanks any, for having other, me on. any other things you want to shout out or mention before we? No. Happy New Year, everybody. Hope you have a good 2023. Yep. All, All right. right. See you later, Oscar. Take care. See ya. If you'd like to hear the extended version of the interview with Stefan, head over to patreon.com slash white centipede noise. Stefan shows me some of his prized possessions from his collection, and he gives a bit more advice on how to approach running a label. You can also get download codes for recent Joestad, Breaking the Will, and Form Hunter releases on the Patreon, and much more exclusive content and benefits. Viewer and listener support is what makes White Centipede Noise podcast possible, so head over to patreon.com slash white centipede noise now to find a level of support that fits you.